Thank you. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about star formation simulations, and I am going to, in some sense, pick up where, as, where, where Phil and Dushan just ended, but I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to start small and then move up. All right, so there are many problems in star formation, and I've been asked to summarize the entire field for you in uh, a little under 15 minutes. So I'm going to focus on two. What determines the stellar IMF, and is it universal or variable? And what controls the star formation rate within a galaxy? And I want to ask this on a more microphysical scale than Dushan and Phil. They're interested in over cosmological time scales, what fraction the baryons get turned into stars. I want to ask a more instantaneous question of if I handed you a galaxy, I gave you the distribution of gas and stars within it, could you give me back the instantaneous distribution of star formation or star formation rate within it? All right, so let's start with what, what physics do we need? And here is where things get nasty, and they're even nastier than in Phil and Dushan's cases, because the physics that you need if you want to get this right, the list is very long. So what ingredients do we need? Well, all right, MHD and gravity, fine. That's, as, as you heard, you know, we sort of know how to do those okay. Certainly at the level of accuracy I'm going to talk about, we're fine. All right, but lots of things that, involved, that involve star formation, particularly if you're interested in protoplanetary disks or anything like that, you need non-ideal MHD. All right, so once the density exceeds about 10 to the 6 particles per cubic centimeter, non-ideal effects probably start to become important. All right, radiative cooling. And here you have the problem that, all right, so there's radiative cooling by lines at densities below about 10 to the 4 per cubic centimeter. But once the density exceeds that, you start getting collisional coupling between gas and dust, and now all of a sudden your radiative processes are controlled by dust and dust-starlight interaction. So you now have to think about three temperatures. You need to think about, well, there's the radiation field, which influences the dust, which influences the gas, and all of these are coupled. So you need to worry about that. All right, you have feedback in the form of ionization, supernovae. You also have winds from stars, and something that wasn't mentioned in the last talk, but if you're interested in star formation in the vicinity of the Milky Way, is almost certainly, in our vicinity of the Milky Way is almost certainly dominant, which is protostellar jets, and that's going to be the dominant feedback process, in, probably, in places where you don't have massive stars, which includes all the star-forming regions within a few hundred parsecs of us. All right, chemistry. Now, whether the chemistry is important for controlling the dynamics is not entirely clear, but it is absolutely important if you're interested in matching the observations, because the main observational tool we, look, we use to look at this stuff is molecular lines, and so you need to understand from your simulations what molecules will be present, and thus what observable molecular lines are going to be produced. All right, and we have this problem of dynamic range. If you take the radius of a GMC, typical size of a GMC of order 10 parsecs, to the size of the sun, that's 10 to the 9. And the bigger problem is the dynamic range in time. If you take the crossing time of a GMC to the crossing time for a sound wave bouncing through the sun, that's also about 10 to the 9. And this is the one that kills us, not this one. This one wouldn't be so bad. It's this one. All right, so what's the state of the art? Well, the state of the art is that no code includes all of these physical ingredients or the full dynamic range. So, Every simulation I show you, I'm going to be very careful to mention what's been included and what's been left out, because I think that's something that's very important, particularly in star formation simulations, because no one's doing it all right. All right, so let's start with what we're trying to explain. Let's start with the IMF. All right, so here are just two observational determinations of the stellar IMF from two recent reviews. And what I want you to notice is things are remarkably uniform. All right, let's look at this one. This is the more recent review. All right, so these are measured IMFs in a bunch of different star-forming regions covering a range of properties. All right, so the data points are the data. These lines, incidentally, that you see going through the data, those are not fits. That's actually the measured field star IMF. So these are IMFs in young clusters, but this is the measured field star IMF. All right. And you see, with maybe, a, maybe the exception of upper SCO, although there's possibly been some dynamical processing, this fits remarkably well. So you've got this very broad range of regions that all show more or less the same IMF, and it's also the same IMF as the galactic field. Some of these contain massive stars, some of them don't. So clearly the presence of massive stars doesn't seem to make a difference. All right, you get the same answer almost everywhere. All right, here's, again, 
another measurement, you always get this characteristic mass peak between 0.1 and 1 solar masses. And we'd like to know where that comes from. All right, so how can we try and simulate this? Well, all right, let me just start by going back to my list of physics, and I will say the top two there that you'd think about first, that can't be the answer. You cannot explain the origin of the IMF just using MHD and gravity. And, the, and I can prove that in two lines of algebra. All right, my two lines of algebra are the following. For a system that consists of MHD and gravity, and that's the only thing going on, and it's isothermal, that's the only thing going on, all right, there are three dimensionless numbers that fully characterize the system. And those three dimensionless numbers, they can be, say, the Mach number, the alpha and Mach number, and the virial ratio. For those three numbers, there exists a transformation that leaves them invariant but changes the mass scale in the problem arbitrarily. All right, and that immediately proves you cannot get a characteristic mass out of just that physics. You need more. So something else on this list must be playing a role in explaining the origin of the IMF. All right, and in fact, non-ideal MHD, if the ionization fraction scales as a power law in the density, which it probably does to good approximation, you can show that doesn't solve the problem either. So it's probably in the radiation physics. All right, so here's a simulation that includes some radiation. So this is one of mine. All right, so this is hydrodynamics. We didn't have MHD for this one, but subsequent ones have used MHD. Gravity, radiative transfer for the dust. We're working at densities high enough that we're sort of out of the line-dominated regime. Stellar radiation feedback and protostellar jets. And this is an AMR simulation done with the Orion code. And the left is showing you the gas column density distribution. The right is showing you projected temperature. The white dots are individual stars. All right, we're at a resolution such that we're resolving individual stars here. We've got 10 AU resolution. So we're not resolving the tightest binaries, but other than that, we're getting individual stars. And this box is about a parsec in size. All right. So that's one example. Here's another example of something similar done by Matthew Bate using SPH. And this is a somewhat lower surface density region going to significantly higher resolution, but not including the stellar radiation feedback, only the radiative transfer from compressing gas. All right, and again, you see the same, sort of, the same sort of thing. Here's temperature, here's density. You see the gas fragment, and you see it heat up. And that heating turns out to be the key to the answer. And the way you know that is you can compare simulations like this to simulations that don't include radiative feedback. All right, so here is a comparison. This is, again, from Stella Offner's recent review. All right, and let's, you can look at either panel. It doesn't really matter. The, point, the, thi the thing I want you to take away from this all right, is that, all right, so black and gray are observations. Red, blue, and purple are simulations with radiative transfer included, and you'll notice that they sort of cluster around the observations. These ones that look terrible, these are measured IMS from the simulations, are the ones without the radiation. All right, if you don't include the radiation physics, you simply can't get the right IMF. All right, so you need to do the radiative transfer. And it's not just radiation cooling. The key physics here is radiative transfer. All right, let's talk about the star formation rate quickly. What do the observations tell us? Well, all right, let's just focus first on the blue and red. And those are solar metallicity galaxies in the, in the solar, or near us, near the Milky Way. Here's gas surface density. Here's star formation rate surface density. And what I want you to notice is that at high surface densities, there's this sort of linear correlation between gas surface density and star formation rate. But as you go to lower surface densities, you get this sharp drop off and then flattening again. All right, so you get this sharp drop off at a characteristic surface density of about 10 solar masses per square parsec. And that appears to be associated with the transition from the ISM being dominated by molecules to dominated by H1. Now, whether that's causal or not is a separate question, but it's certainly correlated. This transition is metallicity dependent. These green data are the small Magellanic cloud measured in exactly the same way. And you see that there's, it's significantly offset from all the other data. All right, the purple points there are low metallicity Lyman break galaxy outskirts and DLAs and DLAs. And again, low metallicity, you get less star formation at fixed gas surface density. All right, so we'd like to explain this. The other observation we'd like to explain is this. There seems to be crossing an immense range of scales, a very, very simple relationship between the amount of mass the free fall time in that gas and the star formation rate. All right, so that on the x-axis is gas surface density divided by free fall time. Y-axis is star formation rate. 
And I just want you to notice the range of stuff that's on this plot. Everything you see in a reddish hue there is an individual cloud in the Milky Way about a parsec in size to 10 parsecs in size. Everything you see in green and blue pixels is a sort of kiloparsec size pixel within a nearby galaxy. Everything you see in sort of purple is a high redshift galaxy, and everything you see in green points is an entire unresolved but local galaxy. And they all fall on the same relation. Everything turns its mass into stars at 1% of the mass per free fall time. All right, and that's true even if you go to regions that don't have massive stars versus regions that do. That's true if you look at galaxies from ARP220 to the Small Magellanic Cloud to Taurus in the Milky Way. Everything falls along this relation. Where the hell does that come from? All right, so one possibility is that the key physics there is turbulence, and this is this is really a numerical experiment rather than a true, si rather than a simulation, all right, done by Christoph Federoff. And it's showing a simulation with just MHD plus gravity plus sink particles to represent the collapsing regions. And all they're doing is they're stirring the turbulence at large scales and measuring the star formation rate. All right, and what they find is that from this simulation, they get a value of epsilon FF, that's this star formation rate per free fall time. That's not quite 1%. It's probably still too high compared to observations, but it's getting into the right region. Now, of course, this doesn't explain where the turbulence comes from. That's almost certainly got to be the feedback that's keeping the turbulence going. But this suggests that turbulence is at least part of the answer. All right, now, the other approach you can take to this problem is you can try and do more or less what Phil did and say, well, feedback is part of the, feedback is what solves it. And I think that's certainly got to be part of the answer. Feedback is part of it. But that can't be the entire answer, I'd say, because we get the same really inefficient slow star formation even in places where there are no massive stars present. Taurus is not turning itself into stars at a rate of 100% per free fall time. It's the same as Orion, still 1% per free fall time, despite the fact that Orion's got a huge H2 region, and Taurus, the most massive star, is like two solar masses. All right. So let me skip the status and end with the challenges. What do we need to go further? And I'd say our biggest problem is the dynamic range in time. All right, and it, this is inherently something that's very hard to parallelize. You need to take of order a billion time steps. The computational cost is dominated by a very small volume taking a tiny time step. It's in fact completely analogous to if you were doing particle simulations, but you weren't allowed to use force softening because it really mattered what the distribution of, say, binary periods was. It's exactly the same problem. Our other big challenge, particularly for specialized hardware, is that these are inherently multi-physics problems that involve many different sort of physical models and modes of computation. All right, we've got our hyperbolic conservation law PDEs, like MHD and HD. We've got our ray tracing, if we want to follow photons in the optically thin regime. All right, we've got our photon diffusion, which we spend most of our time in these calculations, for example, doing effectively sparse matrix inversions. All right, if we want to do chemistry, well, then that may be, if we've got a chemical network, that's maybe a dense matrix. All right, and we have to do all of these things every single time step. So it's a much, much harder problem to adapt to specialized hardware than just doing, for example, n-body and gravity, where your entire computation is, let's do 1 over r squared a shitload of times. All right, so it's a much harder problem. Phil already mentioned this. We definitely need a better treatment of radiative transfer than we currently have. And I'd say that really where there's an opportunity for advancement in terms of interfacing with Phil's stuff is to calibrate our star formation feedback in the galaxy simulations using the results of these small-scale simulations where we do resolve everything, and we are actually doing the radiative transfer self-consistently. And I'll end there.